everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Sarah Skowinski, and I am the Adult Services Director at Portland Public Library. Tonight's event is part of our sustainability series, which we are thrilled to host along with our partners at the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. In fact, this is our fifth season collaborating on the sustainability series. And now I would like to turn it over to Jessica Burton, Executive Director of the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative to introduce our program this evening on the birds of Scarborough Marsh. Jessica. Hi everyone, thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, yes, I am uh, Jess Burton. I'm the director of the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative and we are a network of land and water conservation organizations in Southern Maine um, that work together to protect our land and water. Um, and one of our very basic premises is that we can do more together and our impact is stronger. And this sustainability series, um, this partnership with the Portland Public Library is a really great example of that. Um, and we're thrilled to be here tonight um, in this actually much bigger collaboration. So we're, uh, this, the sustainability series is uh, the conservation collaborative and the library, but we're excited tonight to also be co-hosting with uh, Maine Audubon and the Friends of Scarborough Marsh uh, to bring you this really awesome topic um, about the birds of Scarborough Marsh. And I just do want to call attention to the fact that this might be the largest event we have ever had. Um, <laughs> a couple of years ago, we showed the film Dawnland and we had over 100 participants, but since then we have not, this is 80, we have 88 people in the Zoom room and I just wanna thank you all. And I just, I wanna just put out there, this is really a cool fact that in general, over the five years that we've been doing this, the, the events that attract the most people are ones that are based uh, in nature. Birds are very popular, um, but I just, I really, I just wanna celebrate that and just sort of call it out. And I wanna thank you all for coming. This is really cool. Um, so I just wanted to introduce our speaker, uh, Linda Woodard who has been the director of the Scarborough Marsh Audubon Center for 30 years. Um, she is also a board member of the Friends of Scarborough Marsh. And at Maine Audubon, she is the program coordinator for students grade three and up and leads professional development workshops for educators. She is a liaison to state, regional and national environmental education associations and is currently the president of the New England Environmental Education Alliance. She is an adjunct professor at the University of Southern Maine's Environmental Science and Policy Department. She has received the Environmental Merit Award, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency 2008 and Sphere of Influence Award, New England Women 1996. She spends most of her free time out birding and enjoying nature and fortunately for us, spending time with us, teaching us and inspiring <laughs> us about these beautiful places around us. So, um, I'm just so thrilled uh, to be here tonight with all of you and to welcome Linda. Well, thank you. What an introduction. <laughs> um, and what a crowd. We're, we're at 101. Woo! Um, so thank you all very much for joining tonight. So as uh, Jess said, um, I do work at Maine Audubon. I am the director of the Scarborough March Audubon Center, um, but I also have been involved with the Friends of Scarborough March for a very long time. So um, I'm really pleased to be wearing two hats tonight um, as I present here this evening. So what we're gonna do is I do have a PowerPoint of Birds of the Scarborough Marsh, and um, I'm gonna be showing that shortly. We will be having a couple of uh, quiz questions throughout. So um, this is your place. We have a lot of people here, but we're going to uh, let you put it in the chat. I'm gonna, some of the harder birds, I'm gonna say, okay, who knows what this is? And you're gonna have to, to put it in the chat and see who gets the right answer. Okay, so here we go, sharing my screen. So here we go, Birds of Scarborough Marsh. So there it is, largest salt marsh in Maine, 3,100 acres, the Scarborough Marsh. That little dot, let's see if you can see it. Can you see my cursor? Um, that is the nature center right there. And this was looking at it fairly about mid tide. Um, the marsh is, you can see, is very, very large, um, but it's really a very famous marsh. And um, this particular slide shows that we are in the 50 places to go birding before you die. 
So this is in the entire world. This isn't just the United States or just Maine, it's the entire world. So Scarborough Marsh is an extremely special place as far as birds are concerned. Um, they use it as a migratory stopover. They nest here, they use it for a feeding ground. So the marsh is just extremely, extremely important. We um, have about 300 bird species that have been found in the marsh. Um, and along with all those birds comes the people. So we have um, lots and lots of visitors every year. And birding is really come a huge economic, um, you know, fireball. It's, it's, we have over like $41 million, billion dollars a year in birding. So it's, um, it's really economic, not just a, a natural history thing. If anyone knows about eBird, uh, and you don't know about it, you should. eBird is a great place to record your birds that you're seeing, but also you can find um, out about birds. So this is the list for the state of Maine. And this shows right here, um, the number one place that has the most birds in the state of Maine was Monhegan. And then it says the next place is Biddeford Pool at uh, East Point Sanctuary, our Maine Audubon's in Portland, I mean in um, uh, Biddeford. But you see Scarborough Marsh is number three. But when you look down here at seven, there's Scarborough Marsh Eastern Road. And then if you look down here, it's off the screen, you'd see Scarborough Marsh Dunstan Landing and you'd see Scarborough Marsh Palrico. So when you add all of the different Scarborough Marsh hotspots, we are number one. So um, lots and lots of birds at Scarborough Marsh. Like I said, over 300 species have been seen. And before I leave this slide, I just want to say again, remind people that this, if you haven't used eBird or you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, you can see what's at different places. You can see what's being seen locally. So I just recommend you check that out at some point. Um, this is just what happens. People do checklists on birds. And this just shows you, remember East Point was number two and you see all those red lines. Well, that's all of the checklists that people have reported from East Point. Now look at Scarborough Marsh huge numbers of checkpoints. So a lot, a lot of people visit Scarborough Marsh. So our first bird has to be this one. It has to be the snowy egret because that's sort of the mascot of the marsh. Um, you can see it's the bird with the golden slippers and it's a beautiful bird, I think. And it has those golden slippers and it uses them in a very unique way. What it does is it wiggles those yellow toes right down here in the water and the fish come up to check it out and boom, they get them. So they use it as a built-in fishing lure. So it's, it's quite, um, it has some really, really interesting adaptations. Also, what it has been seen doing too is it'll open its mouth and wiggle its tongue and fish come up to check that out and they just shut their mouth. So that's another um, adaptation that snowy egrets have that helps them catch fish. So these birds don't nest in the marsh. They nest in Stratton Island, which is just off the coast, um, off of Old Orchard Beach. And then they come into the marsh every day to feed. So they're one of the birds that uses it as a feeding ground. It's very, very important to them. And they eat the small fish called mummy chugs that live in the marsh. So the next slide is its cousin, which is the great egret. So you notice on this one that the bill is yellow. You can't see the feet, but the feet are all black. So it's the reverse of the snowy egret. It has a yellow bill and black feet, where the snowy has a black bill and yellow feet. So um, one of the things that I said that we would do tonight is talk a little bit about identification. And that's really a key point of identification is that yellow bill on the great egret and the yellow feet on the snowy egret. Because you, you'd think, oh, well, the difference in size, that would be easy to tell, but it really is hard sometimes when you have, um, you know, when there's not any point of reference or if they're flying. So that beak and feet are the thing to look for. Now we have a very interesting bird that has shown up the first time in the state of Maine several years ago was at Scarborough Marsh. And this is um, a, an egret, a little egret. 
And you can see that plume. Does everyone see that little plume right there? Well, that tells me that it is a little egret. And it should be over in Europe. It should not be anywhere near the United States. And the first record was here in Scarborough Marsh, and it was seen on a bird walk um, that we did on a Wednesday morning. And um, if you know anything about birders, people get all excited about such things. So we literally, it got put out on the internet and we had people showing up from Massachusetts within two hours and then Connecticut and then New York. And it was just amazing how many people came to see this bird. It was just unbelievable. And one woman said, I just ran out and said to my boss, I've got to go. And she just jumped in her car and came to me. So, um, so that was quite exciting, but it's been interesting. It's come back practically every year since. But there's another key thing to point this out, and that is that the snowy egret has a little bit yellow right here, and this one does not, because this is the reason why that's important. You see it's up black there? In the fall, it loses that plume, so you don't see the plume anymore. So you have to look and see if that's all black. Now I took this slide with um, a great egret as comparison so you could see the size difference there. Um, but again, that all black bill all the way up almost to its eye is a very important field mark. Um, you're, if you're lucky in the spring, you can get to see that plume. That's no problem, but that's what you'd look for in the fall. Okay, well, this is an oddity that only appears in Scarborough Marsh. And this is a snowy egret tricolored heron hybrid. And it was first discovered several years ago here at Scarborough Marsh. And people were wondering, what the heck is that? But that's what they have determined it is. Um, and you can see here that does have the little bit of yellow right there. And it does have yellow feet. But this, in the shape of its neck, is more like a tricolored heron. So that's why they feel that this is a tricolor heron snowy hybrid. This one is a little blue heron. And you can see it sort of has the chestnut up here on its neck. And it is just a tiny bit bigger than a, a snowy egret, but it's about that same size. So that one likes to hang out closer down to Pelrico, um, the snow canning road, the marsh down there. We don't see it that often up near the nature center, but it is seen down closer down to that point. Of course, this is the great blue heron. Um, it has its neck sort of down, so it doesn't have the neck all the way up like a great blue heron would. But you can see that it's interesting that actually this, the little blue heron is more blue than the great blue heron. It's, it's almost grayish. It's a little grayer than the, the um, great blue. And this one has the, um, the little blue, excuse me. So it has the plumes here. They have a lot of different plumes for the breeding season. Um, and some of you have probably heard the story how um, birds were hunted for their feathers. And so that's, Mass Audubon was actually started because of that. But that's what they would do. They would come and get them in their breeding plumage in the spring and kill them for their feathers. Okay, so this is our quiz, our first quiz. Is everyone ready? What is this? <laughs> it's Dad. a bird. It's a bird. Yes, very good. So Go I've on. got the, I've, um, Susan Gilpin says a green heron. James, yes. Is that it? Susan, good job. Oh. I know Susan, good job. Yes, that is a green heron. And Eleanor Goldberg and Dorothy Granell and Linda, a lot of people got it, that one right. <laughs> a lot of people got that one. Excellent. Excellent. So um, we do see the green heron at Scarborough Marsh, but we don't see it that often. And that is because it's very secretive and it stays in the reeds. It doesn't come out too much. Um, it does eat fish, okay, like the um, other egrets and herons. By the way, egrets and herons are related, they're cousins. Um, and um, this one also likes fresher water. So you find this one over at Dunstan Landing in Scarborough Marsh, um, over in the cattails and things like that. So, but it's definitely a little more secretive. Well, good job, everybody. Okay, so here's another one. Can you see it back in there? Okay, this is a bittern and an American bittern. And you see how nice and tall it is there. 
Okay. So what they do is they will actually stand next to reeds like these cattails and they will actually sway back and forth in the wind with um, just so that they camouflage. And you can see how well it's camouflaged in here. It could be just another stump, but it's a, it's a heron. Um, it's called, like I said, a bittern, American bittern, and it does eat fish. And in freshwater, it would eat frogs. Now we don't have frogs in the salt marsh because um, the frogs are amphibians. So we can't have any frogs, um, but they do eat fish in the salt marsh. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears. We sort of went through the herons um, and talked about those. So we are going to talk about these guys. Now this um, is an endangered species. So let's see, does anyone know what this is? I know some friends of Scarborough Marsh folks out there are gonna get it. Getting anybody yet? Nobody yet. Oh, I'll give you a hint. It's a sparrow. Oh, Eleanor said salt marsh sparrow. Excellent. Salt marsh sparrow. Yes. Okay. So this is the salt marsh sparrow. Uh, very secretive. It likes to run in the grass. So it's very hard to see. And it makes very soft noises. So you can't hear it too well. But people literally come from all over the world to see this sparrow. Um, because it, it, there's not too many places to see it. But the sad thing about this um, bird is, is that this is its nest. And if you saw the larger part of this nest, it's just in the grass. So um, when there's a high tide, it gets totally washed out. So this is a, uh, a diagram. This shows you the lunar phases. So pretty much this bird has to start making its nest around here and then hatch it and have all the babies by here. So it's a very, very short window that um, it can raise, you know, raise its young, let them fledge. So what is gonna happen to this curve with climate change and sea level rise? I bet you all can guess, right? So this bird is extremely affected by sea level rise. And they think it really be could, could become extinct because it just has nowhere to go. Um, so this is sort of a sad one. It's a real indicator of climate change issues. Um, this is one you can see, it does love insects. Um, so it catches dragonfly here, but it will eat other things. We like insect eaters, as you know, they, they help us when we're out in the marsh. You can see this is banded. Um, they've been doing a lot of research on these birds and um, you know, trying to figure out when they do nest and what we can do to help them. So this is the Nelson's um, salt marsh sparrow, Nelson sparrow, I call it, I'm the old school. They used to all be salt marsh, I mean, the um, sharp tail sparrows, but this one is called the Nelson's now. And you can see how duller it is. It's not as sharp and distinct as the other one. Um, doesn't have the, the real, the orange as this one does. And this is a little bit in the same niche but it does nest a little higher up in some shrubs and things. So this is affected by climate change, but it is not affected as much. So just to tell you one short story here, how crazy birders are to see these birds, and I, I can say that because I am one, is that I had somebody run in the door at Scarborough Marsh and say, okay, I just have one hour, I flew in, and I have to fly out in two hours. So you have to get me a salt marsh sparrow, I'll give you $100, let's go. So we went out and we got her a salt marsh sparrow and she donated a hundred dollars, so. Okay, now this one is another sparrow of the marsh. This is an endangered, but this is a savanna sparrow. It doesn't show that well in online here, but this is really quite yellow right here, right here. So this is a savanna sparrow that is found mainly in the marsh. We do have other sparrows. We have song sparrows that are on the edge of the marsh and we have a variety of other sparrows. Unfortunately, we have some house sparrows too, but um, these two are the, these three, the um, salt marsh, the Nelsons and the song are all ones that you associate with the marsh. Okay, this one, everyone knows this one, the red winged blackbird. So this is a real um, icon of the marsh, uh, the red winged blackbird. It does have that red there. Um, and if I asked anyone why it has the red, it's to attract mate, but also they do something very interesting. And that is that they will flash that red wing and they will 
alert predators and the predators will follow the male away from the nest. So not only is that red used to attract mates, but it also is used to attract um, predators. So this one um, is the female and she looks nothing like the male. So this, she's colored this way because of camouflage and she wants to blend in with the cattails around her. Okay, this one, um, some of you might know, this is the catbird and catbirds are sort of everywhere but they really do nest right across from the nature center. So I wanted to throw these in there. Um, this is another one, and we're gonna be getting into our insectivores here, uh, but this is one that lives and nests right across from the nature center. And I'll do this as a quiz bird too, anyone? Um, Ron and Carol are saying kingbird. Yes, Eastern kingbird. We have a smart group here tonight. Yes, this is the Eastern Kingbird and they um, catch a lot of insects and they nest, right, like I said, right across the street from the nature center. So if you're down there, you can check those out. We have um, some other insect eaters and this is a warbler. This is a yellow warbler. A lot of warblers pass through the state and they use um, our wonderful state as a migratory pathway, but the yellow warbler stays with us all summer long. And so we see that right in the shrubs and it's eating lots of insects. And it's so beautiful. If this is the male, it has that red streaking, but a female's all yellow, just a beautiful bird. And that one um, goes sweet, sweet, so sweet. So if you hear that, that's what it's doing. And it's so beautiful bird. And we have one more warbler and this is the common yellow throat. Um, and that one nests in the marsh also. And that says witchity, witchity, witchity. Okay, going on with insect eaters. Um, this one is a tree swallow and um, it nests in boxes and in cavities around the marsh. But this one is having a lot of trouble uh, is a lot of our insectivores are, and that is because of pesticides. Um, we are killing off a lot of insects a lot of you think, oh, wow, I don't want any more insects around, you know, so we want, have to use pesticides. And, but the thing is that, that when you use all the insecticides and you kill all the insects, you're killing off their food source. So it is a major problem um, that these insectivores have. And Friends of Scarborough Marsh has a lot of information. We're um, promoting uh, marshscaping and we'll be talking more about that in the coming months but we really wanna think about what we're doing to our lawns that are associated right with the marsh and really pretty much anywhere as far as these insectivores are concerned. You have, if you can introduce some natural things like dragonflies and things like that, um, that is a lot more healthy all around than using insecticides. This is its cousin. This is a barn swallow. So this is another uh, swallow that lives in the marsh around the marsh. And um, they also eat green-headed flies, so we really like those swallows. Okay, so we're gonna move away from the passerines or the songbirds and go to some raptors. So great horned owls in the marsh. Yes, we have them right around the edge of the marsh in the trees. And they come into the marsh and they feed. Um, we have moles and voles and things like that. Um, and one time we, when we had some birdhouses in the marsh, you could see them at night perched on the birdhouses swooping down in. This is a winter visitor. I'm gonna show you some winter visitors here because we think of the marsh, we think of summer, but we definitely have snowy owls that come to the marsh. Um, they sort of feel this is like a tundra. So it's sort of like their home. It's nice and open and flat. So definitely come down and look for owls, uh, snowy owls. Okay, you all know what this is. We've been getting more of these around the marsh. Um, you can definitely see them. I was down the other day and I had one fly over my head. So uh, we almost had one nest across the street from the nature center, but unfortunately a high wind blew their nest down, but they're definitely around um, Scarborough Marsh right now. Okay, another quiz bird. Um, let's see, Ron and Carol say peregrine falcon. Definitely right, it yeah. is. Peregrine falcon, um, they especially come through in the fall because the sandpipers migrate through and the sandpipers make a little tasty morsel for the peregrine falcon. Also it's smaller cousin, the Merlin comes through and also will pick off small shorebirds. 
but definitely see this bird, especially in the fall. Okay, osprey. I think probably all of you know this one. Um, this one doesn't nest in the marsh, but it comes into the marsh to catch food. We definitely see it in the spring and fall. Um, it, those Look at those huge talons. They, someone who took this picture really got it just as it was going down to catch a fish. And look at the arch of those wings. It's a very strong bird. It has to go all the way in the water and it has to get itself out of the water, which is really hard. So it's an amazing bird. A lot of people try to, they get the bald eagle and the osprey mixed up when it's overhead. Um, one thing I didn't show you is a picture of the, um, out, the eagle when it's flying, but we call it the flying plank. It looks like a board straight across, okay, with the white head and the white tail sticking out. This one arches its wings a lot more, more like a gull. And it does have a little white on its head there, so it can be a little confusing. Um, but you notice the black and the under here, um, it has that. Of course, the bald eagle takes a couple of years to get to that white head and tail too. So, but that flying plank, remember that, that is really the key for the bald eagle versus osprey. Now this one is a Northern Harrier or Marsh Hawk. And that is the key right there, that white band. And a little bit of a dihedral. Do you see how this makes a V right here? Okay, so that tells me it's also a Northern Harrier. They always have that V. They soar right over the marsh and they look down in there. They will get birds and they will get rodents. So they're sort of an equal opportunity bird. They will eat whatever's around, but they soar right, right over the marsh. Okay, so this is a winter visitor. Um, this one hovers over the marsh and we'll do a quiz on this one. This is a tough one. We'll see if anyone gets this one. Winter hawk visitor, that's my hint. And it hovers. Only hawk that really hovers except for an osprey. Only one you'll see in the winter. So we have Stan saying rough legged hawk. Stan is right. Yay. Is. So that's a tough one, Stan, now, good for you. But um, yeah, so rough legged hawk and you can see the black here and the black here very similar looking to a red tail when you're looking up and you're trying to figure out which it is um, because red tails hawks have a black belly band, usually smaller, but sometimes it's hard to tell, but those black little spots on the wing is the way to tell. And they come down in the uh, winter time and you'll see them over the marsh. Linda, can, yes. I, uh, can I just interrupt for just a second? We had a question and this goes back a little bit to the ospreys about where ospreys nest. Do they? Uh, there are some nests in Portland and in Freeport. If you ever get a chance to go to Wolf Neck State Park, they're nest right off of there and you can see them really easily. But they're a little more common up the coast, but there's definitely several nests in uh, Portland area. So Thank now this, this one is a Virginia rail. And uh, excuse me, this is the Sora, I'm sorry. Um, but no, Virginia rail, I had my slides. I have a little caption here and it's for the next one. But yeah, this is the Virginia rail and they nest in the marsh. Again, they're more towards the fresher water, very secretive. You don't see these too often, um, but they are out there and uh, they have the cutest little black fluffy babies you've ever saw. They're like little black fluff balls. So they're really, really cute. And those are, that's a rail. And this is another rail called a Sora. Um, that lives in the marsh also. So we have a few rails. So another quiz time, endangered species in Maine. Look at the bill, that's the clue. And the white forehead we have there, that's the two things. Uh, Arctic tern? Oh, the good guess well, because Arctic terns are endangered, but it's the other one. What about rail? Mm, no, this is a... It's a very small turn. That's a big clue. I see you, Jess. You're bursting to say it. Go ahead. Is it a, Eleanor is saying least turn? Hey, Eleanor, hey. absolutely right. But uh, we do have Arctics here too that are endangered. They nest on Stratton. This one has made a good comeback. This one nests on Higgins Beach and um, in Scarborough and also nests out at Stratton Island. But the key things on that is that white forehead right there and it has a yellow bill. So that's the key points there. 
And this is it sitting on its nest out at Stratton. You can see some nesting, I mean, some fencing around it. They put that, they call them exclosures, and they put that around piping plover and least turn nests so to keep the predators out and the birds can just run in and out. So least turn on dangerous species, and it really is endangered because of loss of habitat uh, because they do like to nest on the beach. So it is a real problem. And speaking of such things, um, we have a little one right here. This is the piping plover. And again, an endangered species, it nests on the beaches. This year, I tried to get the number, but um, I didn't quite get the number of birds, but it is a record year for piping plovers, which is good. Um, but um, they nest right on the beaches. So it's extremely difficult with people coming in and um, disturbing them. So here's the cutest little fluff ball you ever saw. So cute. Okay, so there's one sitting on a nest. Now, this is another plover. Um, this is the black bellied plover. And you can see all that nice, huge black right there. And in the, the uh, fall, this time of year, there's still a few around down at Pine Point, but none of this. It just sort of has a brown modeling. But the thing about plovers is they have a much shorter beak than sandpipers. So that's a black bellied. And this is the semi palmated um, plover, very close to the size of the piping plover, but it's a little heavier, a little chunkier bird. And um, you can see that it's hard to see the feet, but um, semi palmated means partially webbed. So it has partially webbed feet. This is one that sometimes is in the marsh too, but it's also around on golf courses. It likes roofs that are have sand and gravel on top. This is the killdeer. And all of these plovers do something interesting. They will drag their wing. If a predator comes up, the parents will drag their wing and move away so that they will lure the predators away from the nest. So that's our plovers. This is our one sandpiper that nests in the marsh. This is the willet. And we know it's a willet because it's screaming, we will it, we will it, we will it, quite loudly, especially when it's establishing territory. So we hear a lot of that. But you have a hawk come by or one time a fox came out of the woods, you're going to hear that screaming incessantly. And it's interesting because what happens is one willet will start it and then all the willets from the marsh come over and help it out and see what's going on. So it's quite something when you have like 50 willets all flying above your head screaming. Okay, this is an interesting bird. This is a wimbrel. Um, see that long downward curved beak? Um, this comes through the marsh. This is a migrant. It's more in the spring and the fall. And this is um, not a sandpiper. This is actually a turnstone. This is called a ruddy turnstone. And it's very chestnutty right here, has the bright legs. And you'll see this down a lot of times at Pine Point. I just saw one yesterday. So there are still down and around. Okay, so this one is a um, least sandpiper. It's only about five or six inches high. So it's very small. So that's why it's least. And the key point for this one is the green legs. Look at that greenish legs. And that tells me that this is a least sandpiper. Okay, this is a spotted sandpiper, but I chose this slide because this is what it looks like this time of year. Usually when it's spotted, it has all these spots on it, really dark black big spots. But they always, if it's whatever plumage is in it, it always has this white check mark. See that, that comes up like this. That tells me that it's a spotted sandpiper. And they're very interesting because they bob, they go like this. When they're walking down the beach, they're sort of bobbing along. Okay, this is a semi-palmated sandpiper and you can see um, it has the black legs. Again, it would be hard to see the webbing, but there is webbing there. The same exact size as the least practically. So it's very hard to tell if you can't see those legs, but you can see these are all black legs. Okay, and the least had the green legs. Little less brown, the least sandpiper is a little more chocolate. That's another way to tell. Okay, here. So um, glossy ibis, okay? So this is one that you'll see quite a bit in the marsh. 
and it can be up into huge flocks when it first gets to the marsh and when it's ready to leave. I mean, you can have flocks of a hundred glossy ibis flying around. So that's quite a few ibis. Long curved beak. They look really prehistoric when they fly. Whoops, I'm sorry, I had that. Um, with that long curved beak right there and um, the chestnut and then the black, they're pretty iridescent too. We've had a bird called the white-faced ibis that comes and visits regularly too. But um, there we go. How about this one? Another quiz bird. This is down at Pine Point. It doesn't really come up into the upper marsh, but it does hang out at Pine Point. We okay. have Mary Beth Cyril saying American oyster catcher. Definitely. I tell you, a smart group here tonight. Yes, this is the oyster catcher. And these nest on Stratton Island. And they um, have been having more and more young. So we're seeing these are becoming much more common. Like 10 years ago, we would have been like, oh my gosh, an oyster catcher. But now it's like, oh yeah, the oyster catchers are out. So um, we're definitely seeing more of those. So that's sort of fun. And this one is sort of changing the color of the beak, but it really, a lot of the summer has a bright orange bill, the whole bill. And it looks like just a carrot that somebody stuck on their nose. It's huge and orange, bright, bright orange. And this was a really fun thing that we had this year. Um, we had an avocet come visit and you don't see those too often, but um, we do see them. And um, so that was really exciting. It was out in the pans, um, which is called a pool of water out in off the Eastern trail. And a lot of people got to see that. Look how much that bill curves up, sort of helps it probe down in the mud to get some worms and insects and things. Okay, so we're gonna move away from our shorebirds now. We've been talking a lot about shorebirds. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about these guys. So these are ducks. And you see this a lot at Scarborough Marsh because this is a dabbling duck. So what they do is they just stick their little butt up in the air, reach down as far as they can and get some grass and algae and things like that. So this is the black duck. Um, and that um, looks sort of similar to the female mallard. So some people get a little confused on that, but this bird definitely nests in the marsh. And we have had several, this year was our first year that we did not have um, some black ducks nest right by our, we have this ramp that goes down in the marsh that's an old fenced, and uh, last year, every time she'd go and go out and get some grass and come back, she would leave a pup, uh, her babies on our ramp and then go out and, and then come back and get them and collect them and go off. So it was really fun. We had them all season. But this year, for some strange reason, we didn't. But they usually do. And this is the other one. And I, I sh had a winter version here because, you know, it's getting that way. I hear some people up in Freeport had snow last night. So I don't know. But anyway, these are mallards. Um, and of course, um, the male is on the right with that bright green head and the female on the left. And you can see she does sort of look like the, the black duck. Sometimes people get a little confused, but the black duck is darker, um, much darker, especially on the back and things here. And um, these ducks do winter over. They will stay all year round. Um, they sort of change their position. They might not all stay in the same place, um, but they will stay all winter. And here's some fluffy babies. I'm a real sucker for fluffy babies. These are some mallard ducklings. You can see this was right at our salt marsh. Um, and they have quite a few. And do you think there's gonna be that many at the end of the season? Mm, probably not. But they, um, their, their predators a lot are, are great black back gulls will, will eat the babies. And um, they really get those babies out and into the water quickly. So the predators like foxes and things eat the eggs, but they don't very often get the babies. But the gulls are a huge issue for these birds. And the thing about gulls is their population has really increased. And the reason why they have increased is because of people. People throw their trash on the ground, they throw uh, feed them, if you've probably seen people feeding them french fries and everything down by the co-op or down um, at Bailey's and things. So 
that again, it gets them habituated to people, it increases their population, and it's a real, real problem. Um, not just for mallards, but for eider ducks and all, all kinds of different ducks. But anyway, we get to enjoy these cute little fluffy babies. Okay, so these birds are called gadwalls. Um, and the male and female. And you can sort of tell, we say by the black butt, that's the real key point this, for this duck. This is smaller than the mallard. It's not as big. Um, and it has that black right back there. So that is the key point. Female, you can see is a little bit harder to tell on her what she is if she's not right with the male, but she is smaller than a female mallard. Okay, this one is a widgeon. Okay, again, smaller than a mallard. Has that green on the back of the head like that, but it doesn't have green all over. Has the white here, and it has white here. And these birds, the ones I just showed you, um, the widgeon and the gadwall, they are more of spring migration birds and fall, but a lot in the spring. This is another spring migration bird. Um, and this is a blue winged teal. And that is the real key point right there is that crescent shape behind the eye. It's a real key birding point. And again, you can see it's right in those pans with all the algae. Okay, another quiz bird. Hmm, have I stumped people? This is a small duck that we see in the spring. Where's, we've got a uh, harlequin or a green winged teal. Green wing teal, yeah. Scale pin, green wing teal. Yes, so it's a green wing teal, but um, the harlequin. You, I, it's interesting you say that because they are very striking like that. They have the white that comes up like that. So that was a good guess. Um, the harlequins, by the way, you can see in the winter down at um, Two Lights State Park, but this one we do see a lot in the um, spring as it migrates through. Okay. Not a duck, but we have these. Can everyone spot the little fluff balls? Okay, so we have these two right here. And it probably started off by having quite a few more, um, which I'm sort of surprised the um, Canada geese can sort of take care of themselves. But, um, you know, they do get decreased population by things like gulls. Gulls actually can work together and some will sort of, the, the Canada geese will be attacking one gull when another one swoops in. So. Um, this is a, it's a hard life for them, but um, they're around quite a bit. And some people wonder why um, we see them in the winter when they used to migrate. One thing that's happening with Canada geese is that um, domestic geese are breeding, interbreeding, and they're losing their urge to migrate. So that's an interesting sort of fact about Canada geese. But they are um, very fierce. If you've ever tried to walk too close to them and their babies, they will come right after you and attack you. And I had one woman call me once and she said that a horrible Canada goose um, had attacked an osprey and knocked it right down and went after it in the uh, water. And I was like, well, what was the osprey doing? And she's, well, it did fly sort of close to its baby. And I'm like, well, hey, you know, if it flies close to its babies, the Canada geese are gonna protect it. They're really good at doing that. So fierce guys. Okay, do you see the duck in that picture? No, that's because they're diving ducks, okay? Lots of diving ducks we have at Scarborough Marsh and they're not usually more towards the, the off season, not the summer season, but the off season. Um, this one is a beautiful bird. This is the um, hooded meganser and this is the male and you can see that big, huge hood right there. It's a smaller duck, it's not that big, but hooded meganser. This is um, the red-breasted merganser because it has, you can't see it, but that's really rusty red. And notice that eye, that red eye right there. That is for seeing underwater. It's a really good swimmer. Go underwater, go after fish. If you look closely, you can see right here, there's serrations. And that is to hold on to a fish. So those serrations will capture a fish, hold on to it, and... Um, so very, very built for eating fish. The kids, I do a lot of programs with students and they all tell me it had a bad hair day, but it's always like that. 
Okay, this is a bufflehead, another real tiny duck. It's not that big. Um, but this one comes in definitely in the wintertime. And we see that it's interesting. The nature center is sort of the dividing line. Above the nature center doesn't freeze and below the nature center freezes. So we see this down a little closer to Pine, I mean, to um, the Eastern Trail. And you see it at Pine Point quite a bit. Um, this one is the golden eye. And you see that one quite a bit um, too, even more so than the um, bufflehead in the winter time. And you see those a lot by the, um, on Route 9, right by the causeway and the road over the, the um, river, the Dunstan River there. So you can see that bird and that's a diving bird. It'll go after fish. Um, this one right here, is the um, eider. And this is the largest duck that we have in the world. And this one, um, you can see that long bill right here that goes up right into its head there. Okay, so that one, um, like I said, largest duck in the world. We see it more down towards Pine Point, but you can also um, see it out in the open ocean. And it gets into huge blocks, like a hundred birds per flock. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about birds and just um, want to address some of the things that um, you can do to help. So um, one of the things that we talked about today was like with the sharp-tailed sparrows is climate change. So really, if you want to help the marsh, you've got to really address climate change. Because I once had somebody say to me, well, what is this going to look like? with climate change and the sea level rise. And it's like, it's not gonna be here. It's gonna be gone. It's gonna be underwater. So the birds won't have a place to nest. So we really need to work on climate change. That's number one. Um, in order to sort of figure out what's happening with birds, we need to use things like eBird to track the birds at Scarborough Marsh and um, sort of see what, where, what the population numbers are. So that's very important. Um, we do in um, June and July, I mean, July and August, we have some bird monitoring days where we ask you to come and we go out in the marsh and we use eBird and we count all the birds that we see. And we start really at Pine Point and we go all the way up through the marsh and we do Libby River and the Nonsuch River. And um, we even do like Prout's Neck and we count birds. And you don't have to be an expert, although I can tell by the people guessing tonight that we have some good ones here, but you don't have to be an expert. Um, we need people to help tally. Um, we also go by canoe and kayak and count the birds. So we definitely need some people to do that too. So if maybe you don't know all the birds, but you can paddle a canoe, we certainly would love to have you. Um, this year we took a little hiatus because of COVID, but um, we hope that we will be doing it again um, next year. And we did have people still go out and monitor and um, we just didn't do it as a group. And one problem with um, the marsh is that for many, many, many years, people thought it was a smelly place and you just sort of dump your trash there. So twice a year, um, Maine Audubon and Discovery Marsh Audubon Center and the Friends of Discovery Marsh in the town have uh, cleanups. So we didn't have one in April because of COVID and I've been talking to people and we don't, I don't think we'll be having one this year also, but I encourage, we have like a hundred people on this program tonight. If all of you could just go down at your own leisure and just pick up some, get a bag of trash and walk the roadway or pick up by the Eastern trail, it would be so much appreciated. There's a lot of trash out there because we haven't been out doing our organized clean cleanup. Um, I did one time, I was out canoeing with a group and I saw a mallard duck with a six pack ring around its neck. Now, luckily because it is um, not a diving duck, I was able to go get a net and catch it and take it off. But two weeks later, I had a meganser with the same thing. And every time we tried to catch it, it would dive and go away. So that bird unfortunately did die because of that. So it really is very important to pick up trash. Um, if you wanna just drop it off at the nature center, I have people that you know can come by, you can just shoot me an email. Um, that's one thing I didn't put on there, but 
um, my email is just um, lwoodard at mainaudubon.org and you can um, shoot me an email and I'd be more than happy to pick up any bags of trash that you happen to do. And the town is really wonderful in doing that also. But the marsh could really, really help by that. Um, and then, you know, join um, and volunteer for organizations like Maine Audubon and Friends Discover Marsh. We're doing quite a bit um, to help the environment. Um, there's some things I didn't even talk about. You know, Friends Discover Marsh is really involved in water quality monitoring. And we really would love to have some help with that. So if that is any interest to you. And we have um, some stewardship committees. So we have a lot of different needs and Friends Discover Marsh is totally volunteer. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, you can let me know and I'll you know, pass your name onto the committee. I thought I saw Stephanie Smith here and I know she's um, you know, on that committee too about people who want to become members and um, on the board of Friends of Scarborough Marsh. And at Maine Audubon at Scarborough Marsh, we all, um, we use lots of volunteers. Um, I could not survive and run our organization without them. I have some people that just help people in and out of boats and do things like that. And that's really helpful. Um, and also help in our store and help with projects. I've had several people make PowerPoints for schools or posters or, um, and one gentleman made a, helped me make a salt marsh slideshow with some students from this Wentworth school. That's on Maine Audubon site if you wanna check that out. But so there's a lot of different ways that you can volunteer for both the, the Nature Center and for friends. So I think um, that about wraps what I have to say up, but um, I can leave some time for questions and stories. I love stories. So if you have a story about a bird or something like that, you can tell me and I'd, I'd love to hear. And um, so, so Linda, we have a few questions that have come in. Um, one uh, question is, uh, does Maine Audubon do any birding trips to Staten Island or Stratton yes. Island? Stratton Island, we do. Um, we have th usually three trips out to Stratton Island. Um, this year we didn't because you, when we go out there, what happens is we sit in a blind um, and you're shoulder to shoulder to the person next to you. So we really could not do that with socially distancing. Um, and you know, perhaps next year we'll see what we can do. Um, and we might be able to, I talked with them a little bit about some possibilities for next year um, and how we might be able to do it a little safer. But yes, we definitely have trips out there. And it's so much fun because you sit in the blind and you can see the birds right in front of you. Right. Oh, I bet that's so cool. Another question uh, that someone could answer if they were sitting behind that blind and I suppose looking at an eider is how big is an eider? You mentioned it's a, the biggest duck. So what's um, that? Let's see. If you know what a herring gull size is, you've probably probably seen those down at the beach. It's about that size. It's a big duck. It's very chunky and heavy too. And that's another thing, even though it's you see the body, but you have to, it's, it has a lot of heft to it. Yeah. Yeah. I live on Peaks Island and we see a lot of those. Love that. I love them. Um, uh, so we have another question. Are you monitoring the level of erosion of the marsh banks? Seems a lot of the land is caving into the marsh this year. Um, we don't actually do any like actual measurements. I do know that there's some studies by um, the University of Maine. There's a lot of different people that use the marsh as um, study plots and things. Um, the University of New England does, and even the University of Maine at Orono comes down. So there's a lot of universities doing that. I know somebody that was doing some coring and looking at the soils of the marsh. So we are not doing that. Um, I do want to say that one, what happens sometimes too is that the marsh will cave in on one side and then deposit on the other. So even though it looks like one side is caving in, it really, the width of the marsh stays the same, but it sort of moves. So... That's cool. During this time, have you seen more people out on the marsh over the last six months? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> With COVID hitting, a lot of people are out in the marsh. Um, the Eastern Trail is getting a lot of use. Um, you know, sometimes even a little too much. Um, people need to wear their masks and stay socially distanced. Um, we had a record year. I started this year, July 1st. We, we wanted to get everything going and all our 
ducks in a row. And um, so, you know, make it safe for everybody. And so we started July 1st and really we were busy every day, every day, all my kayaks rented out and people, but people were wonderful. I have to say, I really did not have a problem with people abiding by rules and so. That's great. Yeah, that's been the case across the region, across the state is, you know, preserves and trails are seeing just so many people out, 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 out in, into the um, open spaces. Uh, so we have a story. It's sort of a short story because it's chat. You know, we, we have to keep this to chat, but um, it's from Jacoby and Michaela. Um, it says they, um, with their brothers, saw a dozen common terns flying over Willard oh, Beach wow. in South Portland, which must have been amazing. That must have been really cool. Now, when was this? Did you say in the chat where this, uh, when this, oh, what time was it? It doesn't say here, but perhaps, oh, here it is, this summer. This That's summer. Point. Oh, great. Yeah, they come up into the marsh um, to feed and they will catch those little fish that I talked about, the mummy chugs, which are just like an inch or two long. And um, they fly all the way back to Stratton Island, which is miles, like two miles back to feed their babies, those fish. So the marsh is so important as a food source. It really, Stratton Island and all of those turn colonies could not exist if it wasn't for the food that is provided by the marsh. So a great story. I bet that was wonderful to see. Anyone else? Oh, you have one? Yep. Good. Uh, when you have your own kayak, do you put in on the Eastern Trail? Like in, in, in essence, where do you put in if you have where your do own? You, put in? you can put in um, at our place. Um, sometimes we get busy, but we always, you know, fit you in. Um, what we do is we just ask you to sort of come up to us and say, we have our own boat. You know, where should we park? Where should we go? And we tell you exactly where to go. And we sort of put you in the queue. We'll be putting our boats in and then we'll just say, okay, now you come on in. Um, so, and there's no charge. Um, some people help us with the donation, but it's certainly not mandatory. We want everyone to be able to come regardless of whether they can pay or not or whatever. Um, you can put in, I know where you're talking about on the Eastern Trail, there's a spot or there's an old road that people do put in there and that's fine at high tide. But the problem is when the tide goes out, there's a huge drop. So it's a little hard to get out of there at low tide. But if you were going for an hour or so and the tide was high, you could get in and out there at um, the Eastern Trail. Now, another place to put in is um, down, you could definitely put in down at Pine Point Narrows, um, but um, CV's Landing Road, if you go down CV's Landing Road, there's a place to put in very easily there. There's the big congregational church on the corner. You just drive right down the end and there's a boat launch there. Just maybe three or four parking spaces, but um, usually you can get in there too. Oh, that's great. That's super helpful. Um, here's a little, uh, just sort of a, a fun fact um, from Lydia that the snowy egret could be called a fish tickler because they use their toes <laughs> Wiggling, <laughs> that's very cute. Um, okay, so we have we we now have questions coming in. Oh, um, yeah. So this uh, Jean asks, I am one of the many people who walk the Eastern Trail through the marsh through the marsh from the Black Point Road end. Are there resources at the Nature Center that we should visit on our walks? So maybe okay. like yeah. Well, we don't, we're not open now, so there's really not a lot there right this minute, but definitely throughout the summer, we usually have um, displays and we have lots of things going on there. Um, you can always look at mainaudubon.org and go to the Scarborough Marsh page and you can see what programs we have on. Um, but we also, like I said, have lots of displays and a lot of people to give you some information. We have handouts um, about the marsh. Um, I've had a bunch of students from Wentworth School make slideshows and there's little questions and answer um, cards where you look at the thing and flip it up and see what the answer was. So there's just lots of information. We do have bird and mammal mounts um, at the marsh too. So you can sort of see what we have out there. Now this year, again, with COVID, we didn't really let people in the building, but I'm not one to miss a chance. So I put a bunch of tables outside and I, every day I'd bring out the mounts. And a big shout out to uh, Peggy, who um, gave me a lot of supplies this year. She was closing down her office. And so she gave me some tables and some things that so I could 
put out some of the bird mounts and mammal mounts to, for people to see. Yes, come on down, see us. That is so great. Um, okay, so now we have a bird question. How do diving birds raise themselves out of the water? Um, you mean fly away? I, I, think, I think my guess is that that would be, how do they take to the air when they're, yeah. So, um, or I didn't know if you meant ospreys and things like that. Um, so I'll talk, I'll talk about both, but the ducks, um, you know, they're, they're mostly in the water, but it's interesting, um, birds like cormorants, and that's um, one thing I realized that I didn't put in the slideshow, which is they're so common of the marsh. I don't know why, why that one got missed. It should have been in there. But anyway, the cormorants look a lot like loons and people mistake them for loons, but they um, don't have oil in their feathers. And so they get sit very, very low in the water and they have a really hard time getting out of the water. And you can see them, they almost like walk on top of the water as they try to take off and they flap a lot. And one thing they do to sort of help themselves get out of the water is they'll rear up and flap their wings and try to get some of the water off their wings before they take off. And they usually lighten the load by going to the bathroom. You always see a bird, a lot of times will go to the bathroom before they take off sort of to get everything out of their system. Now, birds like the osprey are amazing. Just if you look online for any video to see that, because they will go down in the water. I mean, they're not a duck, you know, so how do they get out? But they have such strong and powerful wings that they can get themselves out of the water. I hope oh. that answers your question. Yeah, that's so cool. And actually, it, it's great because a story came in about a cormorant um, from Sarah. A cormorant hopped on the bow of our canoe on Runaround Pond in Durham. He stayed for about 20 minutes and we fell in love with him and named him Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, I see you there. Awesome. Yes, isn't that neat? Yeah, they, they, um, if they need a place to dry off, you know, they don't really care. They're like, okay. And um, sometimes, especially when they're the juveniles um, and the juveniles aren't all black, they have a little bit of white on their chest. That's how you can tell. But yeah, they, we had one do that. They sort of, we had our canoes out in the river and it sort of hopped on a canoe. So, and sort of use that to dry off. So, that's but, awesome. But that's isn't that a special, that's a special story, Sarah. I bet that was really neat. So here's a question about what we might see now, um, where and what time of day, sort of. Okay, so um, I really like birds at Scarborough Marsh because you know how, you know, birders have to get up at the crack of dawn to go to birding so you can get to see all the birds. Well, birds at Scarborough Marsh really don't care as much about that. They wake up later. So they're my kind of birds. And um, <laughs> during the summer, the birds, you know, um, again, some will get up early, but they really are more dependent on tides. So at the marsh, it's more important to look at a tide chart. You know, if you want to look at sandpipers, and there's still sandpipers out there, folks, go see them because I saw them yesterday. There's sandpipers at Pine Point and sandpipers at the marsh. The yellow legs are out there screaming. But anyway, they, um, you look at the tide chart and if the tide chart says it's low tide, that's when you go down and look for the sandpipers. Um, so, and the ducks and things, they're still around. Um, the winter ducks are starting to come in. We're in that crossover time where some of the birds are leaving that are here all summer and then the birds, the winter birds are coming in. So definitely the golden eyes and buffle heads have been seen. And um, we're also seeing loons. Loons will come in in the um, winter time. They don't look anything like the loons of the summertime, but they'll sort of come into the harbor. They don't come up into the marsh, but they'll come into the harbor. So that's sort of the usual haunts, but we are in a little bit of a lull because the winter birds all haven't come back and the summer birds a lot have left. So we're in a little bit of a lull, but definitely, you know, there's still sandpiper activity and things out there. And, and uh, hawks definitely go down, look up. I had a peregrine down there just the other day. Okay. We have a few more, we have time for a few more things and, and they are, and we have them here. So I'll work my way through. Um, Nancy asks, can you talk about the trail across the road from the center, specifically the history of it, if you know, if you know that? Okay. Yeah. Well, the row, um, the, the nature center has been there for over 45 years and we've been using that trail. Now I haven't been there 45 years, but um, the trail has been there. 
And um, we use that for a, you know, a lot of the school programs that we do all of May and beginning of June. And we take thousands of school children over there. So that's really that trail is um, starting across the street that is our, we use mainly for our school children walks, our nature explorations, we call them. But it's interesting, there's an old road that goes down through the marsh, which is a special uh, road because it's called a, a Cord Cordigan Road. And what that is, is through, um, they put logs, cedar logs across the marsh. They put them one way and then they stack them the other way. And then they put dirt on top and it's actually a floating road. So it's a a little bit of history right there. That's an interesting thing. And also Dunstan Landing, they used to have um, ships, build ships down there. So they built a canal. So there's a canal that runs alongside of that road. So that's another interesting little um, historical fact. Wow, so much. That's awesome. Uh, Jean asks, how have the food supplies and competition between species changed with climate change? Um, as I said, it's really, you know, we're beginning to see it with the ground nesters. Um, and that's really a problem is that, you know, they just don't have any place to nest. And so they don't have any place to propagate. Um, there will be, we're not seeing a lot as far as food source right now. We're still having a lot of fish there. There's a lot of algae. So there is food source. I would say right now, the most of the problem with the marsh and climate change is sea level rise. And that is really affecting the nesting. So that's what we're seeing now. We will be seeing more and more, you know, other problems as there's less grass that's around and less for the birds to eat, like the ducks and things like that. But. Awesome. Okay, so one last question, and then I'm gonna end with a story. Um, the question is, do you, and you sort of alluded to this, but I think this person's looking maybe for a little more detail. Do you, ha do you ever see loons in the marsh? Um, loons need a quarter of a mile straight away to take off. And if you know anything about the marsh, remember that slide I showed you in the very beginning? The marsh is not a straight line. So it's very, very hard for them to take off in the marsh. So if you see a loon in the marsh, it's not a good thing. Um, they've sort of came up and then they can't get out. So they can swim out, but they can't fly out. So you very rarely see loons. You more see them in the mouth of the river down by Pine Point, um, but you very rarely see them. But one thing before I turn it back over to you, I just wanna say, I do see somebody put my email in the chat, which is great. The only thing is they spelled Audubon wrong the first time, but the second one is right. Um, and um, so Audubon, um, dot org. And if you have any questions that we didn't get to today, or you think about anything later, please um, just email me and I would be more than happy to answer your questions. Okay, so this is the last uh, last story. I think I'm going to be able to follow this. Um, it's from Nancy Montgomery, and I'm going to read it. Um, my post-grad Ohio cousin contacted me in January to see if he and a friend could come camp in our yard while he was here bird watching. We said, sure. So we'll see you for spring migration. No, he wanted winter pelagic diving ducks and had a list of places I knew but had no idea were great for exotic ducks. Two lights uh, past the lobster shack, Fort Williams, leaving the cove below the cliffs, um, two lights state park. Mergansers and so many of the ducks you showed got us hooked. They also spotted lots in January in the Scarborough Marsh. So oh, great. Yeah, that's a great story. Thank you for that story. Um, yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Linda, so much for, for um, your time tonight. This was so rich and exciting and beautiful pictures. And um, it's really been great. And it's been amazing to have so many people here learning yeah. from you. I mean, so cool. <laughs> Just so cool. So, well, yeah. definitely keep the, the questions coming and comments. And if you have any questions about Scarborough Marsh Audubon Center or Friends of Scarborough Marsh, you know, please let me know. And if I can't answer them, I'll send them along to the right person. It's been a real pleasure to have you all here and see such wonderful faces and smart people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We got a good crew. And we will be having our next um, sustainability series at the beginning of December. And we have yet um, to define and identify the speaker, but please stay tuned. You can always visit the Portland Public Library website or our website. 
um, to find out who that is. But uh, these are monthly, and so they'll continue into 2021. And if anybody has interesting topics, we're always open for different ideas. So um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. And uh, great to see you, Linda. Bye. Bye.